Yep. Okay, go. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to Wood by Wright. And we're gonna be having a little bit of fun in the shop today because we are making a molding plane, in particular a dovetail plane. This is the third video in the session. Um, we have been doing the making of the box itself and tonight we're actually gonna be getting into hardening the iron and then making the wedge that goes in and holds it together. So theoretically by the end of tonight we will have a working plane. Uh, we'll do one more video next week where we'll do a lot of the finished detail on it. Um, and I might be doing boxing in there. I haven't quite decided if I want to do that yet. So we'll see if that comes out. Um, so yeah, lots of, uh, lots of fun in this. And um, there are several events coming up here soon. I will be at the Midwest Tool Collectors Association National Meet, and that is in um, Missouri, uh, Springfield, Missouri. Why do I always forget Springfield? Don't forget Springfield. <laughs> That'll be coming up in the uh, September 25th, I think it is. If you go to mwtca.com and look up on there, that is by far the best place in the entire world to buy hand tools. So I'm looking forward to seeing you there if possible. Um, but yeah, anything I need to do before we dive into this? Cool. Uh, my wife is sick tonight, so she will probably be a little quieter. I don't get sick pay though. <laughs> get to work, sicko. <laughs> I love you. So, so uh, he said he was going to Springfield. Now we're not so sure. <laughs> treat her well. <laughs> um, yes, uh, iron. So this is an iron that I got from um, Turn Lee Nielsen. Mic down. Which mic? Is it your mic? It might be mine. It's the fifth one over, I think. The, the fifth one that's one's all the way down. What's this that? One? Maybe sixth one. Yeah, that one. We'll try Never that. Uh, so this is an iron from Lee Nielsen, and they sell blank molding irons. So they come without the profile. Uh, last week I showed you how to file it, and it's basically Ooh, just taking a file and shaping it into place because it comes annealed um, and soft enough you can use a regular file to shape it to whatever you want. Um, now I haven't actually, let me actually zoom in and show you this a little bit better. Clickers up here. Two. And what I did on this one is I focused in on it so you can actually see it. I've shaped the bevel on there and I brought it down the line. So we put it in there last week, we scored our line on there and we brought it down to a nice flat angle all the way across there. And then I came and put a bevel until I matched that line on the backside. Now what I've done is I actually haven't brought this to a sharp point. I've left it dull. It's, there's about a 30 second of an inch running all the way along there. And different, uh, different metal workers will tell you a certain amount you want on there. It's just when you harden it, you don't want this to be perfectly sharp because then you'll get a tip that is over hardened and will actually burn the steel. So you're leaving it with a little bit of material still there. Um, you'll be able to sharpen it afterwards. Now, originally I was planning on doing all of the hardening in the shop live for you. Uh, but then when I turned on my, my propane torches, everything got really, really loud and all you would be hearing is <laughs> And I don't think you want to hear that. Um, <laughs> I just scared someone's pants off. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Um, so I'm going to actually demonstrate and show, but I'm not actually going to harden it. Um, I did that ahead of time so we can do that. So what I like to do is I have, I have three propane torches up here. You don't need three. I've done it before with just one. Um, three just makes it faster, makes it a little more controllable. And I set it up with all the torches coming into the same location here. And then... Oop, focus, focus, there we go. Um, and then I have a pair of vice grips that I clamp onto the iron just to get a little farther away from my hand and heat it up. And I'm waiting until it gets cherry red. And you know it's perfect temperature when you put a magnet on it and it doesn't stick. If it's Wait, still sticking, you have to heat it up Hang on, you're not gonna far. actually turn the fire on? No, because it gets too loud. Oh, you made me a liar in the Instagram post. Sorry. I love you, babe. <laughs> I thought we were actually going to play with fire. Yeah, well, the, the problem is it sounds like... Uh, you send me a picture with fire, and then I promise them fire. I know what they really want. Yeah, it sounds like this. You really can't hear much when it's all going on. They don't want to hear you. They just want to see you work. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your... What you're looking for is you want the iron to get cherry red um, and it will get, you'll, you'll start to see all the colors coming out and down here, actually I can still see it on this because I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, um, tempered it yet. Whoa, can you focus? Yes, I'm going to we can. 
Thank so you can you. see on here, there's actually the colors coming back on the tang. And you'll see this, this straw and blue, they'll start out here as you're heating it and they'll start coming back along here. Um, and so you can go through all the colors of it and it's black <laughs> through here. And then I got about the first inch or so, <laughs> cherry red. And you take it until the point, whoop, don't knock over the propane. You take it until the point you can put a magnet on and the magnet doesn't stick to the iron. And when the iron, when the magnet stops sticking, that's when it is exactly where you want to get it. So the other thing you have to do is you have to get everything set up ahead of time because when you're actually doing this, you're focusing on the tip of that iron and so you need to have everything else out here. And, oh, I stink, I took that out to the garage already. Um, well, basically what I have is I have a metal jar um, about the size of my boiled linseed oil jar um, and it's full of motor, motor oil, used motor oil, so the black motor oil. Um, now, it's not the best thing to use and there are lots of other people out there who will tell you specific oils to use in specific ways. Um, I use a metal jar, Essential. not a glass jar, because um, you'll heat things up and there's a chance of breaking the glass, and you have hot metal and flammable oil spilling all over your bench. No glass jars. <laughs> so you're gonna, get a, you're gonna get your oil container out and ready. You're gonna turn on your torches, you're gonna heat it up, you're gonna have a way of putting a magnet on there to test it. And as soon as the magnet doesn't touch, as soon as the magnet doesn't stick, then you dunk it. And you dunk it until it cools down all the way. Uh, now I'm using O1 tool steel. Uh, so O, the O and O1 stands for oil hardened. There's also A2 and that's air hardened. Um, and that's a, that's a whole nother ball of wax. And then there's, there's water hardened stuff and everyone's gonna have specific things. You start getting into steel metallurgy that there are the people get really bent out of shape if you don't do things absolutely perfectly perfect. Um, but it's a molding plane, it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. It just has to be fairly close to it. Um, so we're gonna dunk it, that cools it off, and that's where this is currently at. Now the next thing is, this is too hard to use. Yes, it is too hard. It's actually brittle right now. If I were to take this and hit it with a hammer, I could probably crack it, or at least sh uh, shatter it, or at least crack it. And I don't wanna do that. So what I wanna actually do is temper this. So I have a small, um, a toaster oven that I'll stick this in and I'm going to turn it up to 400 degrees and I actually have a thermometer to check the toaster oven because the thermometer on the toaster oven itself is really not trustworthy and I want to get it up to 400 degrees I'm going to let it sit there at 400 degrees for an hour or two and let it acclimate and so what you're doing is you're, you're bringing the steel temperature up to 400 degrees and you're letting it sit there until it becomes a normalized temperature and then I'm going to slowly step it down. So and after being there, I'm going to step it down to 300 for an hour, and then I'm going to step it down to 200 for an hour, and then I'm going to step it down to 100 for an hour, and then I'm going to let it cool all the way down to temperature. And that will temper the iron so it is hard enough to hold an edge, but not so hard that it shatters. And that is what you're looking for. I would show that to you, but that would make a really boring video for this, doing that in the shop um, for a live video. <laughs> Any questions right now? No, they're all telling me that they're pampering me. They're being nice. And Alan, <laughs> Sarah's recovery fund, I like it, Alan. So you, you owe a dad joke. Okay, let me see what I got. Um, oh, wait, 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 wait. I got one. Oh, what's that? So, it, okay, I got to think about how to say it with sick brain. Okay, um, so I asked my kids what they wanted for this year for Christmas. They said they wanted a cat. Usually I make turkey, but... Since they asked for it. I like <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sean O'Brien has a question. What was the cost of the iron? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. I want to say 18 bucks, shipping and all. Um, Actually, not bad. So, yeah, it's not that bad. It's, it's just a blank iron of decent steel. It's been annealed. Uh, but what I did find from them, the, the company I used to buy them from no longer makes them and is no longer in existence. And theirs were actually shaped um, on, a, uh, on a belt grinder, so they were actually um, shaped like that. Lee Nielsen apparently laser cuts them out, which is really cool, but the laser cutting will harden the very edge of the steel. And so when you're shaping it with a file, um, I found that the, the very edge of it was hard and you had to break through that hard surface to get down to the soft metal. Once you got down to there, the metal filed off really nicely. Um, but you just have to get through that initial hardness on the outside. Uh, so the next thing is, theoretically we're going to imagine for a moment that I have, uh, that I have, I baked this in the oven and it is now, um, not annealed, what's the word I'm looking for? It's 
tempered, there's the word, and then I've taken it and I've sharpened it up. So we have that little bit left on the tip there. I'm gonna take it over to the diamond stones and just like normal, I'm gonna sharpen it and, uh, and get it up to, you know, hair Alan apparently has a cat. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Dave. <laughs> I don't think you get points for picking on a short sickie, though, Alan. I mean, come on. <laughs> oh, I like that. That fits really nicely. Um, so now the next thing we want to do is we need to make a wedge. So we need a wedge that goes in and locks it down in place. And this is where I normally go to my scrap pile and I find a piece that I have left over that's like quarter inch thick. And so I went over to the pile and I found this, which is perfect. Nice straight grained oak. Um, and so it's the same oak as this, white oak and white oak. It'll work fairly well. Sometimes uh, some people will use a slightly softer wood than the main body. Oh, I'm on the wrong camera, sorry. Sometimes some people will use a slightly softer wood for the wedge than the main body. Theori theoretically, that will allow the wedge to kind of compress down inside. Um, I generally use the same wood, but sometimes I'll play it up with something different. You just Most of the time, you don't want to use a harder wood on the wedge than you do on the body. Um, but yeah, big difference, No, not really that much. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to find out the angle here. And I want to know the difference between the bed and the top of our, uh, of our escapement here. Now, if I, had a pair, if I had a protractor, I could sit on there and find the exact angle. But the nice thing is when you're, when you're initially adjusting it, getting that exact angle really isn't that important. You just need to get it close. Then you put the wedge in there and see what you need to do to it. And you shape the wedge to fit what reality is. So the way I do it is I'll stick this down here. And I'm gonna put my, uh, um, this thing, angle finder, um, bevel gauge. <laughs> wow, that was a I one. like angle finder better. So I'm gonna set that on there and I'm just gonna eyeball it that we are at that angle right there. And that looks about right. The other way I can do it is if I take a 45 degree square, because this bed is at 45 degrees, and I back that off, I can put this on here and then I can move it up close and make sure that my angle matches there. So basically I'm moving my bed angle back parallel to this line so that this fits in there. Uh, and so that's another way you can check your, your angle and get it fairly close. Am I out of screen? I'm just down low on the screen. There. <laughs> Do I need to so move? now that I have the angle on this, then I want to transfer it over here to the block. And I want to pick whatever corner I want to be the corner of my wedge. You can see how this doesn't come to a point. You don't want it to come to a point because it shouldn't come all the way down to the tip. It should stop back here a little ways. And I'm going to put this on here. Actually, let me grab my marking knife. I put that away too early. And I'm going to put a, a mark on here. I want the tip of it to be about a quarter inch, so somewhere right around there. Put this on here. And then we can mark it. Be careful. I've learned that's a dangerous object from Facebook. What, the marking knife? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in a hand tool shop is dangerous. Light, medium, oh, hard. Oh, I forgot, Alan, I forgot. There we go. So I've got my line on there and we can cut this out and then we'll have a wedge. All right, any questions while I'm setting things up? Um, hang on. Apparently my wife forgot about something. Not new, but, oof, I shouldn't have said that. You're lucky, actually, I did hear that, so. <laughs> Now this tiny little piece, I'm cutting on a, a thin piece of material here, and so if I, if I stick it up too high, there's nothing supporting it, and this is just gonna flop around and become a problem. So I'm gonna stick it down a little ways in here, grab a tenon saw here, and I'm just gonna eyeball this, going straight across, not marking anything oh, in the back. There were questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, what's that? Well, I think this one was more of a joke, but you know, with my brain. Rocky Mountain Bear asks, how often do you lose your temper, he he? Never. And I wasn't sure how, often, Don't ask how, my wife. how honestly we should answer that question. <laughs> and then Tim BBQ asked, are three torches really necessary or can you do it with just one? Are what? Are three torches, torches. No, three torches are not necessary. Yes, they are. What's that? Yes, they are. <laughs> um... The only reason I use three is it's just faster. Um, uh. No reason to use three. But. So to get all the way down, I'll get down to my squat position. 
know if you guys can see. Oh, you can't see. No. I'll do this so you can see. This is a lot of people like to laugh at this, so I figured I'd show you what people <laughs> like to laugh at. Oh. How often does a YouTuber brain hurts say, "Here, much. laugh at me"? Uh, two. Whoa. There we go. So Whoa. I do. Oh, can you refocus? Oh, that's better. And I do this. And literally, I come up on my toes like that. And they're actually really nice to balance on. Uh, here, I say back here, you can see a little bit better. Um, I, I work on my toes in wooden shoes quite a bit. <laughs> Had a lot of people ask about that, so I thought I'd show it. There we go. We've got ourselves a wedge. So now, on wood by right, we just did the wedgie. And theoretically, we actually have two wedges here. So the nice thing about that is if we mess up one, we've got another one ready to go. So now, I'm going to play this smooth <laughs> as my cut was a little bit of an undulation there. And I'll grab this one. Cut was a little bit more of an undulation than I expected. And now, let's actually test it and see how close our angle was. So you can slide it in here, and I like to keep the straight grain section of the wood on the bed, and then the fibers sticking up towards the top. Um, some people will argue it needs to be done the other way, but they're wrong. <coughs> they're right. Rubbing on something. What am I catching on? Oh, I still got work to do inside there. Well, hang on just a moment. Got a little burr sticking up inside. And this would be something that's almost impossible to show on video. Let me see if I can do it. Oh, guys. Here we go. Inside here, there's a little bit of junk sticking up from the back. Just gonna work it out. Just using the toe of this float to wiggle it out just a little bit. Hopefully, that should be enough. There we go. Tap this down in and see how close our fit is. Actually, let me put the iron in before I tap it down in. Because the wedge would go down too far. So we can put the wedge, put the iron in, slide the wedge in, and tap it down. I'm going to seat it down nice and hard on this one, and then I'm going to be looking in there. Let me actually zoom in and see if I can show you this. Deep down inside there, and grab a phone. Should get a flashlight in here. Flashlight. And see if I can actually show this. You can see down in there, the wedge has a nice tight fit against the top all the way along in there. And then on the top, it fits in nice all the way up to that line right there. So that's what we're looking for. And surprisingly, that's right where it is. Normally what happens is there's a gap up here at the top or there's a gap down here at the toe. And at that point, what you need to do is then look at it and see uh, if there's a gap up here, that means you need to take more material off the toe. If there's a gap on the toe, that means you need to take more material up in here. So you can take it and adjust it one or two passes of the plane, put it back in. <laughs> it again. It's one of those things you sometimes have to go back and forth three or four times until you actually get it where you want it to be. But uh, this one actually came out perfect. I don't see anything I really want to change on there. So to remove a, uh, you knock it over. <laughs> To remove a wedge from a wooden plane, you either tap it up here on the toe or you tap it here on the heel. Okay. But this one I really drove in there because I wanted to make sure it would seat home the first time. And I really drove it in there. <laughs> there it goes. And so there is our wedge. Um, 
Not quite functional yet, but it is in place. So one of the problems it has when it goes all the way in there is we have this blunt edge here. And as the chips come off of the iron, they're going to want to curl up inside there. And the first thing that they hit after the iron is they hit the wedge. And if the wedge has this blunt end, then they're just going to all curl up on there. And we need to remove the tip on this. Uh, so what we're going to do is grab my plane, put that over, and I'm just going to shave down that tip at a slight angle like this. There isn't any particular angle, <laughs> but that's all I'm looking for. And then my wife is laughing at me. Oh. <laughs> now you got to tell me. Now you got to tell me. No, I thought I typed something different and I made kind of a woodworking joke. <laughs> Uh, Cut Choice said, hi, sorry, sorry, I'm late. And I said, glad you could join us instead of join. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's <laughs> just the, well, little fingers can't type tonight. So theoretically, at that point, this is now a functioning plane. The wedge is in there. The wedge is holding the iron in place. And theoretically, the iron would be sharp. Uh, my iron is not sharp because it's too hard yet. <laughs> I still have to anneal it. Um, I have to temper it. Why do I keep saying anneal? Um, but it's all there basically now. So at this point, usually I want to actually take it for a test drive, see how it has curls, see how things function on it. Um, I want to make sure that there's a good fit in here because usually the first problem is you get jams up here in the mouth. And that's not normally because the mouth is too, uh, too small. It's usually because the wedge isn't fit just right. The wedge, number one, needs to have that angle we just put on there. Number two, it needs to be seated all the way down inside there. So you got to make sure it's touching the back of the escapement all the way down. Otherwise, if the curls come up, they'll get between the wedge and the backboard in there. So you want to make sure you have a nice tight fit in there. Next thing we have to do is actually shape the end of this. And a lot of people are going to have their own particular design or the way they shape one or <coughs> the, uh, the thing that they're looking for. Um, I like to go with a fairly traditional design. Excuse me for a second. Do you want some tissues? They're down before there. Too late. I like to go with a fairly traditional design. And so what I'll often do is I'll grab another wedge that I have and use that as a pattern because there is no reason to, uh, to change if it's working well. So I'll put this on here. And I'm going to go up a little bit higher on this one. And we're going to just put in the shape of this one. I'm going to adjust this one a little bit. I like to have a flat spot up here. Like that. And then we can wrap that out. So we got that shape there. And there's nothing special about this. Um, the only nice thing is if, if a wedge really becomes hard, this little bump here on the end allows you to bring a, 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 a mallet in here and actually pound the, the wedge back out, being able to catch this little piece right in here. So making that little mouth in there so you can actually catch it that way works pretty well. So let's actually do the shaping on this. Any questions while I set this up? Uh, and, uh, yeah, hang on. Cool, we got questions. Uh, Michael Whittingham asked, what species of wood are your fine clogs made of? <laughs> poplar. Yep, cheap poplar. Uh, you ready for another one? Yep, sure. George Dargoltz asked, can you use an old table, table saw blade to make the iron? Sure. Well, okay. Um, I'm going to make a lot of metallurgists and, and metal workers really, really angry with me saying this, but a, um, a carbide blade, you can make an iron out of. Is it going to be the best iron in the world? No. Is it going to work? Yeah. Um, it'll be easier to sharpen because it'll end up being a little bit softer, but it will hold an edge and it will work for you. If you can find an old blade that doesn't have carbides, one that was designed to be hardened, um, one that was designed to be to be sharpened, uh, that one will make a really nice blade because that's that's the steel you're looking for. Um, but the easiest thing, if you if you don't want to buy, I mean, eighteen dollars really is not that bad of a price I mean, uh, for buying the steel. But if you have the iron and you want to spend the time to cut it out, great, go for it. Um, but the other place is actually if you go on Amazon, you can buy a blank of O1 tool steel that is you know three quarter inch wide by an eighth inch thick by however long you want, and you can make one that way. Um, and so I bought uh, tool steel that way from Amazon and other places. What else you got? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> You're laughing at something. 
Oh yes. Mm-hmm. And focus. There we go. So this is a bird's mouth, and I have a couple of different videos on it, but it makes it very easy to do fret work or scroll work. I need to finish up my scroll file. I just have a few little details on it I need to fix up. Get in close. Any questions? Um, Sean O'Brien asks, does anyone make good steel non-carbide blades? Does anyone make what? Good steel... Non-carbide blades. Make them anymore? Not that I know of. I, I'm assuming you're talking about like circular saw blades. And I, I do not know of anyone who makes um, decent steel... Okay, I have to run and blow my nose. I'll be right back. Here. Now we have a blade. Check it out. That's about it. So the last thing that you do is come into the, the file and clean it up. Just do a little bit of detail work on here. And so I'll literally just do this. Is that section. And then, actually, let me switch this down. Up. Now, I don't like working up on top of that for the, uh, the file work, but uh, yeah, once we, once we get this wedge in here, it is uh, all but a functional plane. It's, it's not something that requires um, an incredible amount of, of work after that. It, the rest of it's just beautification and, and feeling good. We're looking for something that, uh, that feels nice in the hand and does, it's, it's comfortable to use. Because one of the things about wooden planes is not that they work really well, but they do if they're, if they're treated well. It's that it, it fits to you, and so you want something that's actually shaped to your hand and the way you work. Oh, I've got two boxes you right have, there. I, now I know where all my tissues disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, babe. I've been hoarding your tissues here for you. We can hear the saw, but not James. So. Can't hear James. Now they can't hear you. Uh, probably couldn't hear me through the fi the saw work, so I was talking at the same time. Oh, uh, I thought they were maybe talking about me and the saw. There, and that is all we need. The only other thing I might do is just break the edges on it, <sighs> just so that nothing else breaks the edges. <laughs> And just like that, we got a e wedge that's ready to work. So now we have an iron, we have a plain body, we have a wedge, and that's all you need to have a functioning plane, as long as I have my iron sharpened and uh, um, honed. There you go. Now the next thing we need to do is actually shape this to be more comfortable, because these corners are not comfortable at all. Um, and so the... <laughs> The English tradition had a rounded edge in the back here where your hand would fit, and then a square edge up here. Um, some would actually round the toe around so your fingers could come around and hold that better. Um, a lot would put the step in here. The reason for the step is, the way it is right now, the iron, uh, the tang coming out of the iron is not in the center of the block. So they would find out whatever the distance is from this wall to the iron, and then you'd take that same distance from, the, from this wall to the iron, and we'd notch that in. So I'm actually going to start in on that, and we'll get ahead for next week. Any questions while I'm working on this? Because I'm hoping next week to have this completely done and actually put finish on live. That's my, my hope, um, as long as I can get the boxing in. Are you done with whatever you were in your video today? Um, well, I wasn't quite sure how far I'd get. Uh, so I wanted, to, I wanted to go on to the next step. It'll save us a little bit of time next week. Oh. What questions we got? Um, Michael Whittingham wanted to know how much do the clogs weigh? Um, they weigh <coughs> that much. Thank that you. much. I'm guessing they're about ten ounces each. Okay. Something like that. They're not that heavy. Poplar is a really light wood. <coughs> so Gandhi836 asked pull asked pull, pull I can't talk or push cut. For 
<laughs> for a coping saw, that is the big question. Um, if I'm working on a bird's mouth like that, I want it on a pull cut because I'm pulling it down against the surface. If I have it on a push cut, it's always going to be pushing the work away from the surface. If I have it in a vise and I'm doing it this way, then some people really like to do it on the pull stroke. Some people really like to do it on the push stroke. Uh, Paul Sellers particularly, he likes to do it on the push stroke. And most traditional Western woodworkers like to work on the push stroke because all the other saws are push. Um, but there really isn't a, a good stroke for it. Um, the, some people out there will say it should always be done in the pull stroke because then you're putting the blade in tension, whereas if you're putting it in the push stroke, then you're not putting it in tension. Well, you are putting the blade in tension either direction. It's just whether or not the frame is in compression or tension. Um, if you're doing it on the pull stroke, then the frame is also in uh, tension. And if you're doing it on the push stroke, then the frame is in compression. Um, so is there a right way? No. But most of the time I'm working with a bird's mouth, I'm going to do it in uh, on the pull stroke. Uh, so the next thing I want to do is lay out where I want this rabbit to go. And so I'm going to come in here, and I want it to come in um, right to this line here. So I already have that line in that I put in earlier. And then I want to put in a line up here, but I need to know, oops, sorry, I need to know the distance from here to here, and then I'm going to double that over this way. So for that, I need to grab <coughs> this worthless thing that I rarely use. Some people call it a tape measure. Um, yeah, it's one of those Yikes, things. Yeah, it's out of focus. I'm out of focus? Is that better? Maybe. It half inch from right there. there. So I'm going to come in from a half inch to there. And then I can set up my marking gauge on that mark I just made. Slide that in there. And put this line all the way along here. And so I can either come in with a rabbit plane and cut that out. Or I could come into the saw and cut down one way and then cut down the other way. Um, I'm probably going to come into the saw. But not too many people want to see a rabbit being made other than cutting that notch out. Okay. Uh, so, what's that? Oh, well, poor, poor man said, wait, what? I'm lost. So I don't know if you... Yeah, we're, we're cutting a, a rabbit into this because on this one... You can see how there's like this rabbit step down in here. Uh -huh. The reason for that rabbit is it makes it a little more comfortable and aesthetically pleasing because then now the iron is going through the middle of the stock, whereas right now the iron is going over on the side here. If we want to leave the same amount of material on this side of the iron as on this side of the iron, that way it just looks a little bit better. Um, so we can cut that notch out. And the next thing after cutting that notch out is starting to round it. And so I'm going to be coming in with a plane and a chisel, and I'll round this down with the chisel. Um, so I'm thinking next week what we're going to end up doing is I'll have this rabbit cut out and I'll have some of the detail work done on it. And we'll make this on here. And hopefully I'll have enough time to put a piece of boxing in right along the tip. And I will have the iron nice and sharpened next week. And we should have a finished plane that I can put some boiled linseed oil and run some curls on. So I'm getting excited about this. Um, yeah, let's answer some questions. If there's other questions to be answered. What? No. No questions? No. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we can go on, unless you want to call it. You probably want to call it. You're not feeling good, are you? Do you want to put such power in my hands tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I think we might make this one a little shorter then, because my wife isn't feeling good. And we've actually gone through this a lot faster. Now, I'm to give everyone an idea of what, what this takes, it's going to be four videos for me to do. And usually in the shop, as long as I'm not actually going through the, uh, the tempering process, um, the actual work of making a plane is around four hours for me. And so if I do four lives, that's about right. Um, usually the work that I actually do in the live is about 20 minutes of work uh, for my normal work without actually doing a video. Um, so every hour of work that I have on a live, you, you can kind of imagine that being about 20 hours of actual shop work. So hope that it was answering a few questions for people. Um, yeah, so I think we'll wrap it up then. Well, Moonwolf wants to know what you usually use to make your measurements with instead of a tape measure. Um, rarely do I actually, well, normally if I wanted to do that, I would grab a stick and I would put my thumb on it and I'd go this way and then turn around and put it that way and put a mark on it. Um, the, 
the idea of this is one of these fun tangents. I missed the idea it. of measurements. The only oh. reason for measurements is for me to transfer information of distance from me to you. So you need to have the same measurement stick that I have. If I'm just <coughs> doing measurements myself, it doesn't matter what I use. They don't have to have inches, feet, meters, or centimeters. That doesn't matter at all. Um, uh. One of the common ways is using a little depth gauge. And here, let me show you how to do this. This is the way I normally like to do it, but I like pulling out the tape measure just to rub people the wrong way. Wrong way. <laughs> I never rub people the wrong way. I'll set my marking gauge on here. Put that on there. <laughs> lock it down. And then I can slide this over here. <coughs> and then do the same thing there. Put a mark on that. And that's the easiest way for me to do it generally. Is that way I'm, I'm using reality to transfer a mark to reality as opposed to some ubiquitous number that really doesn't mean much. Because um, the numbers don't mean anything. It's just a, a stick with graduated marks on it. So, yeah. Uh, actually, if you if you look at uh, some of the the old um, historical ways of measuring, they're kind of interesting. Is that you would have a measurement stick that would be used on a work site or a project, and it'd be very specific to that particular craftsman. And the craftsman next door would have his measuring stick, and it would be different. Um, and that was that was actually fairly common. Um, you'd see uh, there are a lot of um, what's I'm looking for. Um, trail workers and they would have their measuring wheel and so they'd actually have a wheel on a stick and we measure it out. Now you could get wheels that were specific measurements and you'd use those for surveying or things like that. Uh, but as long as your wheel was always the same, then every time you rolled it out you'd get the same measurement because you're using it against reality as opposed to using it against some random measurement that a government put out. Sorry, side tangent. <laughs> I, yeah, I was kind of wondering. But um, <laughs> there's yeah. been a couple requests for clog dancing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta watch that on Instagram. I don't do that twice. <laughs> I don't know how you she got that one on video. I don't know how she got that one on video. <laughs> <laughs> I was not a part of this. <laughs> um, yeah, you were. <laughs> I was actually kind of surprised. Shorts didn't split. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all gotta watch the video on now Instagram. She back at me. Like, find us. However, it works on Instagram. My brain is not working. Cool. Would I right. we'll, we'll call it then. Is uh, this is just not as good without a full Sarah here. Working with a half a Sarah is just. It's it's like a short movie. That was a really bad joke, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll end it there. <laughs> So I think that'll about do it for now. Stick with us for next time, and we will be finishing this up and having a molding plane when it is all done. So I hope you like this. If you did, please let me know in the comments down below. And uh, if you have any particular idea of something you'd like us to do on the live, let me know that. Um, oh, as a reminder, um, normally I was, I was telling people last week that hopefully we'd be having the, the, the last actual construction video of the bed this Saturday. Well, that didn't work out because apparently when I milled up all the boards months ago, uh, three of them I cut six inches short. So I've got to go mill up three more boards. Oh, I was going to put that on. Oh, you made it. So instead, I was gonna Saturday, say we're actually getting, restoring this um, Sorby saw uh, from Sheffield, England. Um, so we're, we're cleaning this all up and working on getting this working again, doing some refitting on there and putting new nuts on it. So this will be out Saturday. So hopefully you like this. I know it's not a bad, but uh, a beautiful old dovetail saw like this is a lot of fun. So I think that's about it. Um, anything I'm forgetting, babe? Cool. I hope not. <laughs> Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Oh, hey, again. I oh, here's the, the button, button push game, and this is going to take even longer than normal. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Bye. <laughs>